uh, that calendar thing too, the Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Okay. Okay. Great. And we're live and broadcasting. I'm going to share my screen now. Stop Dr. Metz for just a period of time here. Okay. And I know I have to shrink that up. Welcome. Uh, I see that uh, we're live broadcasting and people are streaming into the webinar. We want to welcome you to the Washington Academy of General Dentistry Stay Home, Stay Healthy CE Series. Uh, thank you to all our speakers, our presenters. It's been wonderful. We've had, I think, about 38. We're going on 40 of these webinars so far, and we're going to probably end up uh, total with about 50 some of them. So it's been a wonderful couple of weeks uh, talking with everybody and just the support we're getting from all our dental colleagues. We appreciate it. Speaking of our dental qual uh, colleagues, we'd like to thank uh, Comet USA, Patterson Dental. We'd like to thank the University of Washington School of Dentistry CE Department, who will be handling your CE credits. Uh, your CE credits will be emailed to you via the email address you signed up for uh, this webinar at. Give it a couple of days. It'll they'll come from the University of Washington School of Dentistry CE. They will not come from the Washington Academy of General Dentistry. There will be a PDF attached. Just put your name on that PDF and save it for your records. Those of you that are AGD members, we will be reporting your uh, AGD credits, your CE credits directly to the Academy of General Dentistry, and those will go on your transcript. You should probably see them within two to four weeks. We've got lots of great webinars coming up here over the next few days. Uh, please uh, take a look at the flyers that are going by. You can use the QR code that's present on one of those flyers, or if you miss the flyer, the QR code, just go to WashingtonAGD.org. Yes, the webinars are being recorded and they'll be available on YouTube for a period of time. Uh, we get those up actually quite quickly now. Valerie uh, Bartoli, our executive director, has done a great job. Uh, yesterday's um, webinars are already uh, at YouTube. So at YouTube, it's Washington Academy of General Dentistry, or you can go to our website, WashingtonAGD.org, uh, and just click on uh, Click on the YouTube link there. Uh, we'd like to thank the Arkansas Academy of General Dentistry and Dr. Kenton Ross for putting our series of speakers together today. It's been wonderful. He did the, the heavy lifting there to get uh, <laughs> our speakers uh, on board with us. Yeah, I appreciate that. That took a little bit of heat off of us here at the Washington Academy of General Dentistry. Like to also thank the Canadian Academy of Restorative Dentistry and Prostodontics for sending the information out to our good friends at Card P and uh, all our Canadian dentists that have joined us. I think we're at over 1,600 Canadian dentists that have been on the webinars, so appreciate that. Like to thank the International Academy of Nathal for putting on uh, yesterday's speaker. And thank you, Dr. Paul Hasegawa, for doing the work on that. This Thursday, the Canadian Academy of Restorative Dentistry and Prostodontics has lined up our speakers. So be sure to take a look uh, and sign up for those lectures as well. We uh, look forward to seeing um, Dr. Mark Douglas, Dr. Kim Parlett, and Dr. Ian Tester present on behalf of the Canadian uh, Academy of Restorative Dentistry and Prostodontics. For those of you that are looking for CE opportunities, hands-on CE, don't forget our 2020-21 Master Track program has been put together. We have four sessions uh, during that series. It's so four sessions, and there's 28 hours per session. These Master Track programs are designed such that if you started day one uh, and went through our master track program after five years in the master track program you would be able to obtain your mastership in the academy of general dentistry 
This uh, series was the brainchild of Dr. Gary Hayamoto. So thank you, Dr. Hayamoto, for putting that together. And we have a nice uh, educational facility here in Washington. It's at SeaTac, which is right by the airport between Tacoma and Seattle. We have an educational center that can house um, about 140 for lectures. We can do 50 some for hands-on courses. And we also have five fully operational dental chairs for hands-on courses. Uh, so just go to washingtonagd.org and you'll see uh, more of those course offerings. Uh, you know, like everybody, we're anxious to get back up to doing hands-on here. Uh, and we're gonna continue to do these webinars through to May 18th when we're scheduled to get back into our offices here in Washington State. Um, there is some more CE offerings, webinars coming up for next week. We just uh, are finalizing the details on those. Uh, and so uh, if you don't see them uh, on these flyers here, take a look at our Facebook page in a day or so. We should have some more course offerings up there and that's Academy of General Dentistry uh, and that's at uh, Facebook. So we're getting uh, close to having everybody in on our Zoom webinar here. Uh, the numbers are clicking up. Uh, we've got over a thousand signed up, uh, registered for this webinar. So thank you very much for choosing to spend some time with us. We really appreciate it. We'd well, like to welcome uh, some of Dr. Metz's friends from China, Japan, Peru, and I'm sure there's a few Canadians in there as well. So thank you for joining us. And oh, and also the Australians that uh, are good friends of Dr. Metz. We appreciate it. So just taking a look at our numbers. This is uh, for those of you that haven't done a Zoom webinar. Uh, and I know there's probably only three people on the planet that haven't. But uh, play around with your interface there. There's chat features, there's Q&A, um, there's hands up. We're not gonna use the hands up feature. No sense putting your hands up for anything unless jo Dr. Metz asks a specific question, asks for a show of hands. If you have questions for Dr. Metz, please put those in the Q&A uh, section. And what we'll do is when we get to the end of uh, his presentation, then myself or Dr. Ross will handle the Q&A. Chat function there, uh, if you wanna open your chat window up, you'll see uh, some comments, some information from Dr. Gary Hayamoto, uh, just uh, with some web links, etc. cetera. So uh, don't use the chat function for questions. We, uh, if you could please put your questions in the Q&A section. And if you go to that Q&A and you see a question uh, that you were gonna ask and you like it, just use the thumbs up, the upvote. Uh, sometimes that doesn't work for us. Uh, it's been hit and miss, but if it's uh, operational, please use that. Um, okay, so we're just past noon. It looks like we have the vast majority of our participants here with us. I'm Dr. Tim Hess. Uh, I, I'm from the Washington Academy of General Dentistry. Uh, I'd like to introduce you to our panelists, Dr. Gary Hayamoto, uh, Dr. Herb Edwards, and our Executive Director, Valerie Bartoli. Our guest panelist today from the Arkansas AGD is Dr. Kenton Ross. Welcome. And I would like to, th <laughs> like to thank all our sponsors, um, Washington Academy of General Dentistry, our Stay Home, Stay Healthy CE series, the Canadian Academy of Restorative Dentistry and Prosthodontics, the University of Washington School of Dentistry CE will be uh, uh, creating your CE credits for you. You will receive an email from them within the next two or three days. And that will come in PDF format. Just put your name on that PDF, send it for your records. AGD members, we will be uh, uploading your CE credits to the Academy of General Dentistry. Those will show up on your transcript within two to four weeks. We'd like to thank Comet USA, Patterson Dental, Seattle King County Dental Society, Snohomish County Dental Society, Pierce County Dental Society, thank you for your support. 
Well, with that, uh, uh, just one more thanks, and that's to all the presenters that have volunteered their time. The Stay Home, Stay Healthy CE series is, uh, these are free webinars. They're open to any dentist, any hygienist, staff members, uh, whoever you want to watch. And the only reason we can do this is because our presenters have been so gracious to share their time, uh, their expertise uh, without any honorariums. If you miss one of our speakers, uh, please go to YouTube. You can catch their webinars uh, at a Academy, uh, Washington Academy of General Dentistry or go to our website, washingtonagd.org and you can click on that YouTube link. Uh, well, Dr. Ross, it looks like we've got uh, just about 90% of our participants in. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Uh, again, thank you to the Arkansas High AGD and welcome. Could you please introduce our speakers? It'd be my pleasure. Thanks, Dr. Hess and, uh, and Valerie and all those that have put together such a hard bit of work to get these guys together, uh, Dr. Yamoto and Dr. Uh, Edwards. It's been fantastic learning uh, from the, you guys. So many webinars we've had, uh, and we've got another great one lined up right now. Um, it's, uh, it's my pleasure to, to introduce uh, Dr. James Metz. He is a highly accomplished leader in the fields of reconstructive sleep apnea, solu uh, sleep apnea solutions and TMD treatment. A graduate of the Ohio State University, he served as a major, he also served as a major in the U.S. Army. Uh, Jim followed the route of restorative and TMD dentistry throughout his career, starting with the International Academy of Anthology and later a member, as a member of the American Academy of Restorative Dentistry. He went through all the chairs of his local dental society. Moving to Columbus opened opportunities at the University, at, I'm sorry, at the Ohio State University College of Dentistry and Case Western Reserve School of Dental Medicine. Later, he became active in the American Academy of Dental Sleep Medicine serving on the board of directors and chaired other committees. Deciding to follow the medical path, he became the associate director of the Sleep Medicine Fellowship Program at the OSU Wexner Medical Center from 2009 into 2015. Currently, he is chair of the dental uh, interest group of the American Thoracic Society. Um, and I've gotten reconnected with Dr. Metz uh, recently at the Restorative Academy, and we had him uh, set up to do a three hour uh, presentation to our study club and he really bailed us out because that was before COVID hit and he was there and ready to go with this. So it's been a partnership. I think Dr. Metz would agree that we've uh, we've all been thrown into this digital world and doing more and more of it than we ever have. We have a bonus today joining us. Uh, I just recently took Dr. Metz's two-day course online and was introduced to Dr. Pat McBride and she's with us today. She has over 42 years experience in treating sleep disturbed breathing she is board certified in clinical sleep and has made over 20,000 appliances in her career. So Pat, thank you for joining us today. Without further ado, Dr. Metz, take it away. Thanks, Ken. Can you hear me okay? Yes, sir, go ahead. Okay. Uh, my topic is dissecting the mandibular advancement appliance more than just a snore. But first, I wanna thank Dr. Timmy Hess and, and Ken and the Washington Academy of General Dentistry. This is really an honor and a pleasure to be able to do this. And everybody that signed up for it too, I'm, I'm humbled by the number that are on this call. Um, I, I changed the topic just a bit because of the virus situation we're involved in. So it's, there's a little bit of a bend in it toward that. And it doesn't have my normal slides. So if anybody's ever seen my talk before, this is pretty much new. Uh, I love to climb mountains, and to be honest, uh, that was my goal to get healthy, was to learn how to climb a mountain. And this is Mount Evans in Colorado. It's a beautiful place, and I feel this whole topic is about getting healthy. It's not about stopping snoring. It's not about stopping sleep apnea. It's about really getting healthy, because stopping sleep apnea does lead to health. Changing the complex easier, to making the complex easier to do and understand and changing the world one patient at a time has been my slogan. And the little starfish on my lapel attests to that. The symptoms of obstructive sleep apnea are pretty well known. Snoring, even light snoring. Uh, once uh, I heard a speaker from Mayo said, when you call it simple snoring, you're simple. <laughs> I always thought that was a good line. 
full or partial cessations of breathing during sleep, fatigue, excessive daytime sleepiness, morning headaches, general lack of energy during the day, high blood pressure that is difficult to control with medication, frequent trips to the bathroom during the night, disturbed sleep, waking often in the middle of the night, unrefreshed sleep, and a last fibromyalgia. Those are all things that are connected to it. This whole uh, mandibular advancement device started Pierre Robin in 1902, and it was called the monoblock. And I gave you this reference down at the bottom. It's, it's an interesting read. Um, Jim, you need to share yes. your screen. Can you it's share? Not share? No. Yeah, sorry. No, it's not shared. Uh, your uh, microphone was a little better uh, in the test there. Did you change position of it or anything? No. Okay. Let me do one thing. Oh. Jim, have him go through the protocol again to uh, hook up with his computer. Yeah. Okay. The, uh, that was, yeah. He's got it. There we go. Uh, yeah. there we go. Terrific. Thank you. Okay. Let me show you. This is my first slide. I just love that slide. It's actually a theme, uh, not evidence. Uh, yeah. Go back to the first slide for just a second there. Let us see that for a second. It is, it's in the uh, Brooklyn Academy of Arts uh, in Brooklyn. I just thought it was gorgeous. I took a picture of it with my, my, with my uh, iPhone. But uh, there's a parking lot right about where my name is now. You can drive all the way to the, the Summit Lake, they call it. But it, uh, you know, the big thing about this is, is it gave me a goal of what I want to do because you'll see pictures of me before and I was 100 pounds heavier than I am now. And I wanted to get healthy to be able to get up these mountains. For some reason, I wanted to be able to climb them. So that was my goal. And when you're talking to patients, they have to have a goal. What do they want to do? You know, Pat has a beautiful garden behind her. And I wanted to be able to garden, be able to bend over and do all kinds of things. And if you're overweight, you really can't do these things. So you can really help people with this. Symptoms of obstructive sleep apnea. Snoring, even light snoring, and like I said, anybody that calls snoring simple or simple snoring is simple according to Mayo. Four partial cessations of breathing during sleep, fatigue, excessive daytime sleepiness, morning headaches, general lack of energy during the day, high blood pressure that is difficult to control with medication, frequent trips to the bathroom during the night, disturbed sleep, waking often in the middle of the night, unrefreshed sleep, and fibromyalgia. Pierre Robin started all this in about 1902. The reference is down below. It's an interesting read to go through his work early on. What I've said uh, is that I, the requirement for this talk is to have an open mind. Uh, more, than, more than anything is to clear your mind of prejudice before you hear this material. I won't ask you to accept anything that I don't have referenced. But I do think you've got to be careful because look at the evidence carefully that you may be currently using. Uh, read the entire paper and look up references on any paper that you feel is worthwhile. And avoid opinion. Logic and passion can get you into trouble. What I'm trying not to do is filter the literature through my brain and just try to present the literature as cleanly as I possibly can. You don't want my take on it as much as you want the true reality. Uh, I love this story about the starfish. It's this why I wear it on the lapel. It's the uh, little boy was walking along and all these starfish had washed up and he was throwing one back in at a time and this man came up to him and said, why are you doing that little boy? And he said, well, I would really like to save these starfish. He says, yes, but you can't. You can't save them all, so why are you bothering? He picked up another one and threw it in, but I can save that one. So save one person at a time, and that's really what you're looking for. And I love this Mark Twain. It ain't what you don't know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. And this has been a hallmark of my life. I wanted to find apnea and hypopnea first. Uh, people have trouble with that. And I usually skip over it, but uh, today I didn't. Uh, you have the apnea on the left and hypopnea on the right. 
And what you'll notice is that um, you'll have an airflow where the apnea has a complete cessation of breath uh, and hypopnea has a partial cessation of breath. But I'm going to start drawing problems with these definitions because what it is, is if you have greater than 90% obstruction, it's considered an apnea. But if you have 89% obstruction, it's considered a hypopnea. Now, how much difference is there between 1%? You can't cut things that fine. This is the arousal. You can see the EEG electroencephalogram at the top, and that's brain waves that uh, shows that the patient's waking up. And that's due to this uh, effort in, in the diaphragm flowing so hard that's tripping the, the arousal. And you'll notice that the dip in oxygen comes after, after the obstruction. And the same thing with the hypopnea. This is the SpO2 or oxygen off of a pulse oximeter. And it's a cessation for 10 seconds. What's interesting is, is if you uh, take the SpO2 to zero, say in other words, there has been no drop in saturation of oxygen, you'll get the same look to the EEG, the airflow, the effort, uh, the, the, everything is the same. So this idea about defining it off of oxygen is a problem. So we go by apnea plus hypopneas, and that gives you a number, apnea hypopneas per night, the total number per night. And then you take that total number per night, and say someone slept, uh, slept 10 hours, and you have 100, so you put 100 on top, uh, and an hour slept, 10 on the bottom, so your apnea index would be 10. So you divide the hour slept into the number per night, and that gives you the apnea pop index. This is a little bit deceiving because uh, it's actually the time of sleep. If somebody is awake during the night, you really shouldn't count that time as time of sleep. And that raises the apnea index considerably. If, say, someone lays awake uh, two of those 10 hours, you should divide it by eight hours, not 10 hours, because it is sleep time, not in bedtime. And that gives us our AHI, apnea hypopnea index, which this whole field is, revolves around. AHI severity, the definition of it is less than five is normal. Uh, greater than five and less than 15 is considered mild. 15 to 30 is moderate, and greater than 30 is severe. However, I'll be talking about the Wisconsin Polar Study several times during this talk, and it shows that, in, and I'll bring this up again too, the, an AHI of zero has negative implications on the heart. I wasn't able to go into that in real detail on this one, but it is something to remember. Just to keep an open mind, uh, you've got to be careful with what you think. Uh, so I would like to ask the group a question. Are longer or shorter, shorter apneas more harmful? Are longer or shorter apneas more harmful? And if you just send a text in Zoom, we'll check it at the end. But just to challenge you a little bit, I always thought the longer apneas were more harmful. But as it turns out, that's not true. Participants with the shortest uh, quarter of the uh, vent duration exhibited a 31% increase in mortality compared to those with the longest duration. So the long is less of a problem than the short duration of the apneas. They say the body has ability to rest during an apnea. Uh, that's just conjecture. What I went to was the Food and Drug Administration in, 19, uh, in, in April 16th, 2018. And what it was, study design considerations for devices including digital health technologies for safe sort of breathing in adults. Most major academic research laboratories were represented. Uh, represented. I had flown 36 hours the day before. It was, it was a terrible day the day before. And I got there at seven in the morning and I was really tired. But what I was, it, this one kept me totally awake. There was no consensus of definitions. They started off asking, define an atom. There wasn't one group in that room that accepted anyone else's definition. So those definitions I just gave you were thrown out the door. They didn't even make it to the first table. The hypopnea, that was even more contentious. And then adding up the AHI was totally contentious. Because really, AHI is based more on men than it is on women. 
because of uh, the studies were initially done on men, 40 to 50 years old. And so the NHI is centered around uh, man problems instead of woman problems. Okay, what is the real problem? Uh, we all talk about the healthy lifestyle versus the unhealthy lifestyle, the junk food and everything on the left, and the healthy and hard and you know, that on the right. But some people try really hard to get healthy, but they can't. And so why is that? Well, I, that's me on the left. This is me, 295 pounds. Um, my friend Neil is here. He just he was infected by COVID very early on. He survived. He's on a ventilator for five days. And a lot of what I'm going to talk to you about, we've, I ran through Neil, and he's working on it. Uh, living the life you want to live is what you're asking the patient to do. So I didn't want to live that life. And I, um, before my daughter's wedding, my daughter is a white uh, plowsman, uh, I was inside of a boat, and it was a problem. And this was at her wedding, so I'd lost the weight in a matter less than a year. And I was able to climb. This is on Rainier with my son Carl. I wasn't able to summit with him, but I did summit uh, this past year on the Evans route and um, actually led the group up the mountain. So it was a, it's, it's really been a, a challenge for me to get healthy again, but we all can do it if we want to. Jim, if we go yes. back a couple of, if we go back a couple of slides where we show the slim versus heavy. I think yes. a real important thing that uh, both you and I really stress to our patients is that when you're looking at the gentleman on your left, of course you're seeing somebody who's morbidly obese and is ectomorphic carrying the bulk of their weight around their midsection, which raises their risk of heart attack and stroke significantly. But you also need to be looking at, especially now that we're dealing with COVID, uh, inflammatory processes. Because the worse your diet is, the heavier you are, and the more inflammation you have in your system, the sicker you're going to become overall. And your risk for all of these diseases that uh, lead up to sleep apnea as well as make sleep apnea exacerbated and worse leading towards early death have a lot to do with the inflammatory processes that start when you are thin and escalate as you get fat. Thank you, Pat. That's exactly right. I appreciate that. Dr. Uh, Metz, um, just uh, I'll interrupt. Uh, we're just getting lots of comments about the sound there. Let's uh, let's try moving the microphone uh, closer uh, for a second and see if we get better sound. And or and if that doesn't work, we'll move it away. Is your videographer there with you still? Yes. All righty. Is that any better? Let's see. Is that any better? What? Test, test, test. Well, let's see. That sounds better to me. Okay. Okay. Let's, yeah, let's, we'll see how it goes. And if we have to interrupt you again, we will. I'm sorry about that. You're right ahead, Timmy. I'm interruptible. <laughs> that does sound better. So thank you, sir. Oh, good. I got it closer. Okay. These are the, I, these embarrassing pictures I show, I'll get to show again. <laughs> but I am proud of going up Rainier with Carl. Uh, this is a sympathetic nervous system, and this is really the problem. Uh, the sympathetic, basically, you have two sides that to the parasympathetic is repair, sympathetic is danger, and they, they work independently, and sympathetic always trumps parasympathetic, always. So what do I want to talk about about that, about weight? Because people say that sleep apnea causes obesity. I think Oh, uh, I, I think, I'm, I'm sorry, obesity causes sleep apnea. I think uh, it's sleep apnea can cause obesity because if you look at the, uh, in, on the, on the sympathetic side, you inhibit peristalsis and secretion in the uh, large bowel and in the small. And so you get, you absorb more calories from the food that you eat. It moves more slowly through you. And as it does, that was made for when we were pre, uh, you know, uh, pre our history. And it was if somebody was in danger, it was usually they were out of food and it helps them to survive a situation. So sympathetic activation, this is the whole deal. And it's not well controlled by CPAP. That's well documented. How do I, how do I check this for accuracy? 
I use the high resolution pulse oximeter. It's 0.1% uh, in patient safety software. This is the old Minolta 300i that we used for years. Fleury's the one that did the initial research on that in 2004. And I, I repeated a lot of his work in 2019. But now, uh, since uh, Minolta quit producing it, we're using the SleepSat software that's uh, an oximeter that's very similar to the Minolta 300i, and I'm getting very similar results. I put them both on one hand, and I get a very similar outcome from both uh, the Minolta and the SleepSat. So this is available. It's about half the price. It's critical to your understanding because you need some, you need eyes. You need to be able to see what you're doing and whether what you're doing is, is making a person better or not better. I've used this thing on the mountain. I use it to climb with. I do it all the time. Whatever makes me have a higher SpO2, that's what I do. This is a sleep stat and there is a code for it, MDL10. If you're in my study group, it gives a 10% discount if you decide to buy one. Uh, I, have no, I have no financial interest with them. Uh, but the SpO2 is 0.1% is and no other pulse oximeter on the market in the United States that I know of has that 0.1%. It also has one second interval measurements, shorter averaging time, um, it, and it can do multi-night reports and titration reports. They have new software that puts everything together for the one patient in a folder. It's really handy. I've been pushing them forever to do this. And now they also keep track of what the pulse rates are from night to night variability, or it's, not night, it's not variability, uh, heart rate variability, it's pulse rate variability. And what, if you do something, uh, a, pulse, uh, a pulse oximeter can pick up the changes from a, from a um, inhibitor advancement device or sleeping position or whatever else you choose to do. This is way a, a, a good pulse oximeter looks on top. This is a nice slope to a graph. You can apply an algorithm to that and gain a lot of data from it. This lower graph is what the normal pulse oximeter puts out that only records to the full percent. And you'll notice it's a square wave and you cannot apply an algorithm to it. You, you lose an awful lot of data. Um, and it's interesting, all PSG recorders sold today do not have oximeters. Uh, recording to the 0.1%. That, so if you have a PSG or a polysomnogram done in a hospital, you will not have the benefit of a high resolution pulse oximeter to the 0.1%. And that does matter. What is important about an HRPO? You can change the patterns. When I mean you, you as a dentist, you don't know you're changing patterns, but you are. Like if you make a, a, a denture that's very well made with a thin palate, the HRPO, you can see the difference in pulse rate and you can see the difference in SpO2 even sometimes, depending on the age of your, pa the age of your patient. If you change the position of implants or you put in a partial or you put in a bulky bike plane, you, and if you run a pulse oximeter on it, you can see changes with every one of these. So you don't really need to take my word for anything. I wouldn't tell you wrong, but you can prove it all to yourself. The thing is, patients, uh, physicians cannot change the heart rate with CPAP, only with medication. They can give you an ACE inhibitor or some other heart med to, uh, to reduce the heart rate, but they can't change it with an appliance or the thickness, believe it or not, of a denture. What you're trying to do is you have the sympathetic activity and the parasympathetic activity. And when you have this active heart rate down here on the lower, lower left, this uh, is sympathetic in nature. So that means the parasympathetic is down. So that means you're in the fright flight system and the body's not healing very well. It's not taking care of normal business. But now if you're able to change that to the one on the right, this is the same patient, goes from there to there, all of a sudden parasympathetic activity is way up. So you're getting healing. And I feel that makes a huge difference. So this is interesting. There's a patient on top and on the bottom. This is the heart rate. And this is before and after on a mandibular advancement device. And it, you can just see the top is where they started and the bottom is where they finished. Now, let me show you one other patient. Uh, the body is a one trick pony. First, I need to tell you about that. It only reacts to stress with the release of epinephrine, norepinephrine. That's the only stress response it understands. 
And so it's the fright flight system. So what about this one? It's totally crazy. Look at the top. This is the same patient on the bottom. I didn't, he didn't have an appliance, he had nothing. This was on the top, that's full AFib. And on the bottom, it, it's not good, but it's not bad. What was the problem? It was alcohol. He got, he got sloshed before he went to bed. And that's what changed his heart rate. So, you know, it makes me very uh, adamant about telling you that if somebody's going to continue to drink, your oral appliance is gonna have difficulty helping them. You, they need to take care of themselves and have a goal to become healthy. A lot of alcohol is not healthy. And so alcohol really does kill people. So it's drugs. And I got this from Pat. I'm gonna let her talk about it. Uh, we do three nights at a time because there's a strong night to night variability. So I wanna see what in their own bed, what they're actually acting, how, how they actually look. So Pat, you wanna say something? So when you're testing people with high resolution pulse oximetry throughout the week, one of the beautiful things about sending it home on Thursday is you're gonna get a better indicator as to what this person is really doing at home at night. You send it home on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, for the most part, people are gonna test fairly consistently, but not the same as they would over the weekend. And they have to get up every day, it's early in the morning, get in the car, get to work, so on and so forth. So their tendency is to kind of not hang loose and live their life. I want to see how people are living their lives when I do this. So routinely, I send it home on Thursday. And Thursday night, you might have a glass of wine with dinner, uh, you got to get up Friday and go to work. So it's a fairly decent first night test is like, oh, you're getting used to having this thing on and you move on. Friday night, they go out boiling with the guys, have a couple of beers and it looks a little different because now they've relaxed a little bit more. They don't have to worry about getting up. So you're going to start to see some of the behavior that is weekend type behavior trickle into your results. Saturday, they go to a party. Not only do they have two or three beers, but they might have a couple of hits off a bong and then you really know what happens with them. So I can take these three nights and lay them side by side to the patient. I'm not gonna judge them because it's not my business and it's not my, it's just not what we're here for. But if you're gonna make an appliance, you wanna make sure that's gonna work at its optimal when they're living their life the way they choose to live it. But surprisingly enough, when you lay these sheets out three nights in a row and you say, well, on Thursday night when you did whatever you did, and Friday, you can see how this is different because you had a couple of beers. And Saturday, well, everything went to hell in a handbasket because of the decision that you made, which might be a weekly thing, a monthly thing, a yearly thing. But now that you can see what this does to your body, you can choose more wisely and perhaps differently moving forward. That's exactly so it's, it's a learning. It's a touch point for learning and behavior change. I really appreciate Pat doing that because I was doing three nights, but I wasn't catching Saturday night. I was having some trouble. And that, that little tip really helped me. It's not a little tip, it's a huge tip. And people will say, well, I only want to do one night. If you do one night, you, you don't know what you're going to get. You can, and that's the trouble with PSG to the polysomnogram in the hospital. It's one night in a contrived position. Or if you get three nights, you can get a pretty good average of what the patient's really like. The natural history of a generic disease. Uh, um, uh, Wayne, uh, Dr. Peck uh, from um, uh, Penn talked about this early on. He started the sleep program at Penn. And this is any disease process. And I'm going to divide it into three uh, seg segments. And I would say the first is the ADHD. That would be the child early on. It moves into TMD, and then it moves into obstructive sleep apnea. But it's just a continuum. And I'm going to address the TMD thing, believe me. I, I'm not going to just get by with saying that and go on. The basics. There's three patterns that I see on oximetry. Basically, the one on the left is the norm. This is the way you should look. You'll get it once out of every 100 people. It, but that is ideal. The one on the, the next one, this is the TMD patient. Now, notice the oxygen looks pretty good. It's a little raggedy, but not bad. The heart rate's nuts. If anybody starts doing this and they find that not to be true, I would love to see the pulse oximetry report because I have not found it. And I've, I've, we've done to date over 14,000 nights of study. Now on the right is the obstructive sleep apnea with the heart rate 
uh, down below. What's interesting, you notice the heart rate is fairly low on that one is because it's controlled by two medications. So, Pat, this is a Pat slide too. You don't want to be a group of mouth. You want to breathe through your nose only. And there's three videos that are going to be attached to the Washington AGD website uh, where I go through this in detail. And so I didn't want to take time for it in this, in this talk. So mouth breathing is, is a problem, and I've worked very hard not to be a mouth breather. But anyway, Pat showed a grouper slide, so I've got a grouper slide now. <laughs> I thought it was funny. Upper airway resistance syndrome. Uh, this is what your TMD patients are going to look like. Now, the way you read these graphs is they're like a stoplight. The green is good, yellow is caution, red is bad. And so all the way across, you can see it's in the greens. That looks wonderful. That has an EHI of essentially one. And this is an RDI off the pulse ox that always overestimates just a little bit. And so if you sent this in for a hospital study, it would probably it would be a zero. But look, the oxygen's a little raggedy again, but look at the heart rate. It's absolutely nuts. That person doesn't sleep worth a darn and she's 19 years old. And this is the classic TMD patient. So let me uh, blow, go into that a little further. I love this paper by Gilles Levine. Uh, it was in Dental Clinics in North America in 2012. And I think this graph sums it up better than anything I've ever seen. Uh, this, is the, this is the pulse rate from the slide before. And if you'll notice, this is the ramp up of the sympathetic nervous system. So the crescendo up to that point that is created right there. So what's happening at that point? Well, what, what does that trigger in the body? Well, it, it, it triggers a sleep arousal. It triggers tachycardia. But now this is where it starts getting interesting dentally. The next thing it does is, well, it runs blood pressure up. And then it triggers the supra and the infrahyoids. It triggers it before the arousal. So the body knows that it's coming by a few milliseconds. So it triggers it. So it tightens up the suprahyoid and the infrahyoid. Now what that would do, if those fired only, the jaw would open and it would swing back and shut the airway even more, which is a bad thing. So what does the body do? It knows that. So it fires the masseter medial pterygoid and stabilizes the mandible. So the, inferior, uh, the infrahyoid and suprahyoids can propel the hyoid bone forward. And so it, it, you know we stabilize the mandible first, and that's the TMD complaints that we talk about a lot. And as a dentist, we stopped at the bottom of the mandible. But if you, if you go back and read some of the uh, older literature, it doesn't. It goes clear back and down to the throat. Refractory TMD cases in my practice. I've been doing TMD for a long time, and I did it pretty traditionally. And uh, I had about 25, 26 people, I wish I could get better track of this, that basically didn't get better. And I sent them everywhere. I, I won't name the places, but they, they went outside of Columbus. They went wherever I sent them, maybe a long ways away, several states away. And anyway, they came back, and most people did not get much better. And so they decided, since I was pretty nice, that they would stay in my office, and we just wouldn't talk about their TMD complaint. We just wouldn't bring it up anymore. But we, they wanted us to clean their teeth. Well, I got to understanding this a little bit better, and I made probably 25 to 30 of these appliances for free. And to my knowledge, and I wish I'd kept better track of it, I don't know of anybody that didn't recover to, maybe not totally, but gave, got considerable um, relief from having a mandibular advancement appliance. So, PSG, uh, polysomnogram. It's expensive. It's patient resistance. They don't want to sleep in a, in a hospital. They say they don't sleep. They don't want to have somebody watch them. They have low level oximetry and, and they cannot accurately measure an oral appliance effectiveness because an oral appliance takes time to heal. It's not like CPAP where you turn it on and it starts to work. It takes time and I'll show you that in a little bit too. It's unfavorable, unfavorable environment and they might not catch the next night and they tell them never to drink or never to take any medications. And so that's not the real person. So it, you can't titrate an oral appliance that way. And so it misses drug and alcohol abuse. And so it's not acceptable for the titration of an oral appliance. Now I must say here, and emphatically so, 
I work with sleep physicians, I work with uh, cardiologists, I work with ENTs, they have to write the prescription for me to make a oral appliance uh, for these patients. I never break that law. If it's above five on my oximeter, I, you know, they all get referred. So, but to titrate it in between the first study, which is the, you know, the initial study to find out the severity and the clearing study, I use oximetry the whole time because it's considered not to be uh, 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 diagnostic by the American Academy of Sleep Medicine, but it, to me, it totally is. It's a wonderful device. And oral clients are just not CPAP, and these labs are set up to uh, do CPAP. Now, Pat uh, titrated her appliances in a CPAP laboratory, and she did an excellent job with them, and you, her results are wonderful, but she spent, spent uh, the night as a lab technician in there watching her patients. It was quite a burden. So there's no fairy dust there. What you'll usually see is sleep medicine's party line on PAP therapy, CPAP therapy, continuous positive airway pressure. You'll see efficiency is very strong and adherence is not good. But on the oral appliance side, uh, adherence is good, but the efficiency is not so good. This is Peter Sestouli and Kate Sutherland, and I really like them both. They're both friends, and I'm, I, I'm not, I'm not, I, I'm just taking exception to them. I don't believe that. I feel uh, the oral appliance can be equal to CPAP, and I'll, I'll show you our paper that proves that. Um, the normal stages of sleep is, is pretty, it's this sleep architecture. In the beginning, this is the stage three sleep. It's delta, slow wave sleep. This is the restorative sleep. This is uh, what cleans up your brain, makes you feel better the next day. And then you have these REMs. And this is what is essential for the body. Uh, it is, uh, and they're very regular throughout the night. You cycle in and out. But what's interesting, CPAP is only used for three and a half hours on average. And that's been documented in many trials. Uh, and and Mokasi that I have down here at the bottom is a reference. What's interesting about him, he showed that high blood pressure was not related to non-REM sleep. It was only related to these red lines, to REM sleep. It wasn't related to the others. And he proved that without a doubt. And when you put the CPAP on at three and a half hours or 3.2 hours, then you miss the last two thirds of the night. And so that's the reason why people continue to have high blood pressure with CPAP. CPAP does better by far if someone will wear it for eight hours every night and especially when they take a nap. Normal stages of sleep divide into two groups. There's stage one and stage two. So stage one is like, oh, I was awake and I said, no, you were asleep. Stage two, is, oh, I must have fallen asleep for a second, but very light sleep. And that's about 50% of the night. Stage three and four, that's the old number. They've combined three and four into just three now. Uh, it's about 20% of the night. And this is a restorative. This is what cleans up your brain, helps with memory and all that. RAM is about 25% of the night. And that's, that's normal. But let me show you but what happens when you get a blocked airway. So it blocks at the back of the tongue. Or and it's really most always, there's a, I go into detail about this, but there's, this is a lot about the epiglotta, epiglottis and a lot less about the tongue than we've been told. But that's one blockage. But the other blockage is in the nose. And they can have that in the nasal blockage and be absolutely as blocked. So you gotta, you know, not everything is blocked at the back of the throat. It can be blocked in the nose as well. Anyway, this is what somebody looks like that's blocked. You'll notice there's no deep sleep. And the REM is very irregular. They're waking up a lot during the night. They're getting doses of epinephrine and those are trips to the bathroom usually. So lack of deep sleep and, and REM fragmentation, uh, there's a problem with depression, daytime sleepiness, impotence, memory loss, nightmares, headaches, high, high blood pressure, huge blood pressure, uh, type two diabetes and fibromyalgia. But what's interesting about that is, is now put on CPAP. This is what CPAP looks like. Now I'm gonna add CPAP to this graph. So three and a half hours a night, so they get three hours of, of pretty good sleep. 
And that's restorative sleep. Uh, it helps clean the brain up. They feel better the next day. But so feeling better doesn't mean much because if you're talking about physiologic health, because they're missing most of the REM cycles at the end of the night. So that's what's giving them the high blood pressure. So feeling better and having high blood pressure are two entirely different things. Most sleep clinicians will agree, and I like this quote, that if a patient with sleep apnea, um, my picture's in the way of my slides, is uh, symptomatic and has an apnea pop index of HI of more than 15 events per hour, he or she deserves treatment. 15 events per hour, I mean, that is way beyond where we should be treating people. I mean, if the Wisconsin cohort study showed that an AHI of less than one caused high blood pressure, why aren't we treating less than ones? It's because it's too expensive and it's not well understood, I believe. And the Wisconsin showed that. And the zero OHI, AHI patient is the DMV patient. So it, it, it really, if the TMD patient is mother, father, grandfather, grandmother, aunts, uncles, it's high blood pressure, type 2 diabetes in the family, I think they're probably going to run the same path more likely because uh, you inherit the airway just like you inherit the color of your eyes and everything else. Now, we in dentistry can change that. Rick's doing a great, Rick Robley is doing a great job of changing that for a number of people. Problem is, medicine does not have the answer, but it has part. Dentistry does not have the answer, but it has part. Success must include many things. Sleeping position, for one thing. Sleeping on your left side is important. Control of reflux or GERD, gastric esophageal reflux disease. Weight, exercise, breathing pattern training. That's on those videos that, I, that are, will be available on the website. And goals. The patient has to have a goal for what they want to do with their life. Like, I'm, I'll be 73 pretty quick, and I have some goals that I don't want to be interrupted. I, I, I want to see things. And there's the dentistry. And finally, there's surgeries that can be performed to help these patients. SAVE trial. This was a nail in the coffin for CPAP. This is the one that showed that 3.3 uh, hours per night was the mean duration of adherence. And what it said was, this is New England Journal, uh, therapy plus CPAP with CPAP plus usual care as compared to usual care alone did not prevent cardiovascular events in patients with moderate to severe obstructive sleep apnea and established cardiovascular disease. That was the first trial that came out to show that. And it was done on you know, many sites. It's a big trial. Then there have been several articles that, came, that come up again. You notice Mokazi is on this one again. Results identified 2,994 unique articles, research endeavors. Certainly in the estimate was, um, certainly in the estimated effects was low or very low for most outcomes. In other words, they didn't get much as far as an outcome in these almost 3,000 studies. Conclusion, the panel made a, a conditional, very weak recommendation that PAT therapy during sleep be offered to patients with OSA to improve outcomes. This recommendation was based on very low quality evidence. So this was another problem. This is a strong systematic review. Um, sorry. Uh, we, we in dentistry have no acceptable literature either to support an inhibitor advancement device for patient outcomes. We don't have that literature. Dentistry has been underfunded tremendously. Uh, it's very difficult to get an NIH grant. I, we may have one going now. I got my fingers crossed. But it's not well studied and well documented. And, this, and the, the trouble with like our TMD studies, they're so small. They don't take in the whole encompassing uh, arena of different peoples, male, female, young, old. We kind of mix everything together. And so we end up with succotash a lot of times. Case study, that's the lowest level of evidence, but it is evidence. So let me show you a little bit. So you get airflow restriction in the young, and you, in the middle age, you move into sleep apnea. 
And then as you get old, you get into hypoventilation. That means your lungs can't fill up completely. And the, finally, you get chain stokes respiration. That's where the body doesn't control oxygen and CO2. I'm really going to go into that one. I, I want to show you all about that. So the airflow restrictions, TMD in my estimation, and sleep apnea is the mild to moderate, and then it moves into the chain stokes. They won't have TMD. This is an 89-year-old man with chronic heart failure. And if you look, initially, this is, this is where he started, a very significant desaturation. So I'm going to show a lot of slides on this. And at four years, you can see that uh, the oxygen, the SpO2, the line looks pretty good. It looks, it looks really great, but that's after four years. And I want to talk about all this, but just I want to give you an overview before I move into it. So this is what happened. Initially, I put this in. And he was a strong sleep apnea. And he said he, he was feeling fine, really no trouble. He had no trouble at all. He wasn't wearing CPAP. His heart rate wasn't, wasn't responding to all these desaturations. It had given up the ghost. And uh, then after three months, you start to get changes. He was uh, on too much blood pressure medications here. So the heart rate was not, was too low. So the physician adjusted that. And this is called chain stokes respiration up here. It wiggles around a curve, and I'll show you that around a straight line. I'll show you an example of that. And nine months later, this is where he was. And look how the, how the pulse rate dropped over time. And look at the improvement in pulse rate. And all I did was I took this big round ball of a tongue, or epiglottis, and the obstruction, and I allowed him to breathe. That's all I did. And this is what happened. So this is initial. Three months, the patient is feeling great, but he's not great. This is Jane Stokes. This is, this is very unhealthy. But look, at nine months, there's, you know, uh, one, pressure, one blood pressure medication with reduction of dose. So what I want to show here, this is four years later. And if you notice, his SpO2, his uh, oxygen rate, continued to improve. One of the things about oral appliance therapy that people don't understand sometimes is it takes time for it to heal. All we're doing is setting up conditions for healing for our patients. Uh, Bill McCorris so always said that's what we did with TMD care, set up conditions for healing. And it's the same way with this. You're setting up conditions for healing and the chain stokes is gone. So let's go into that a little bit. And this is, it's Pete Dawson is who this is. Proud to work with him for a lot of years, and I miss his emails. And um, this is an email I got from him, but it's got, I, I appreciate it very much. It's quite a man. And if you can read his book, A Better Way, I think it's a, it's a way we all, as dentists, can live a better life and a more complete life. And um, I, I, I really miss him. This is another paper that showed that that may be possible. The end was fairly low, it was 47. And it really wasn't very well conducted, but it showed the general, general trend that what we showed in our paper. So here's Pete. Oh, and I, uh, I actually gave a table clinic at the Restorative Academy, and he sat there through all of them, I believe. And uh, he said, uh, I said, Pete, would you wear this oximeter? He said, Jim, I don't need it. I feel fine. I really feel good. You know, I, I'm going to play golf. I'm, I'm okay. I said, be your friend. Would you please do this for me? I think everybody over 40 should be tested just for the heck of it to see where you're at because sometimes feeling good. Uh, Strollo showed that from Pittsburgh that half the people have no daytime sleepings. So this is Pete. These are the big desats. And this is what obstructive sleep apnea looks like. It goes down. This is the oxygen. Down, down, up. Down, down, up. Down, down, up. It's called a sawtooth pattern. There's a lot more there I can get into, but that's for another day. The, here he is uh, at three months. And I said, Pete, you got to go see a sleep physician. He said, Jim, I'm feeling fine. I'm not going to do anything. I'm not going to go. I said, Pete, you'd make me feel better if you did. Can I talk to your pulmonologist? He said, no, Jim, I'm feeling fine. I'm really feeling good. So anyway, this is, this is Chain Stokes. And I think, oh my God, I'm going to hurt Pete. You know, and that's the last thing I want to have happen. Well, we kind of went on. And this is where he started in 36, and he was at 31, but these other numbers have dropped too, and there's significance there. He dropped from 400 down to 
113, and that's important, but that, that takes more time. So we go into this. So this is what his patterns look like. And if I draw a line through them, and you notice how the squiggles are above and below the line? That is Chain Stokes respiration. That is, that's Chain Stokes. And uh, let me, and, and it's definitive. And so I'm going to use this, uh, you know, uh, thermostat to demonstrate Chain Stokes. So you want to keep the temperature of the room between 71 and 69. But this one is keeping it between 80 and 60, still an average of 70. So that's called loop gain. It's the concentration of CO2 and O2. So it hits the max CO2 here and uh, least O2 here, and it kicks it on and off. So it keeps you in this nice tight little range. But when you're resist, essentially your receptors are worn out and they're tired and they, people, things do get tired. And, a great person to hear speak on this is Ron Harper. I have his CD here, if anybody would like it. He's at UCLA at the Brain Center, and he talked a lot about this. And it actually burns up centers in the brain. So what we're doing is, this is what they call normal loop gain, where you're staying in a little tight range. And this is abnormal loop gain. So that's what Jane Stokes is. So the CO2 and the O2 are not in that tight range, not like this, they're like this. And so you get these crazy up and down patterns. So this is an example, and I put this, this is the largest reference I've ever put in the bottom, New England Journal of Medicine. Adaptive servoventilation, there's a lot to talk about that called ASV, it's a specific kind of CPAP. It's actually a respirator. And they thought it was gonna work really well for these chain Stokes patients as it, because uh, they need to be treated. But out of this trial, this is in 2015, chain Stokes respiration may be a particularly instructive example. Although its presence surely predicts a worsening, a worse prognosis, its treatment does not seem to improve that prognosis. In other words, you can't treat, you can't treat, uh, you can't treat chain Stokes, but we did with an oral appliance. It's very different. The body doesn't know an oral appliance is there. That's the big difference. It knows that a respirator is there. And the, there's an interesting part about the chain, so uh, the ASV is in uh, 2015, actually they did an interim study on that and they found out that the ASV was killing people 35% faster. Mm -hmm. Right, no mm -hmm. more studies, no more studies on ASV. Yeah, there's one more, it just came out. Yeah. It was, it, and what it showed was it had, uh, it's the same way with oral appliance therapy, and I was going to use it as an example, but I, I just can't forget it, is two of the ASB units made by uh, companies really caused trouble. The other two did not. It was the algorithm by how they were delivering the, the airflow, which was causing the problem. It wasn't as much the idea that this wasn't a good idea. It was that the, the machine wasn't doing something that was compatible with the body. And I, I thought that was interesting. So here he is at three months after, I'm sorry, after eight months, this, this screen for things right in the middle of mine. Um, so he went down to an eight. It was really interesting. And I went down to St. Pete and I, 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 you know, to adjust the appliance and he's been up here too, but I, I went there this time. And, um, uh, he said, well, Jim, you know, my, uh, my grandson seems to have the same problem. Can I use that for him? And I said, sure. And so I got it back in about four days from Pete. He's always absolutely punctual. And um, I thought, oh, golly, his grandson's not going to hear this because I'm going to recommend a mandibular advancement appliance. He's only 21 years old. So I got on the phone with Pete and I said, Pete, your grandson. He says, what are you talking about my grandson? I said, well, I thought this was your grandson. He said, no, that was me. And I think that's the best Christmas present I ever got in my life. But, you know, over that, I had no idea that over that six month period of time that he was going to heal. But we set up conditions for healing and the physician took him off the medications as he needed to. And it, it was just something, it, it's the high point of my career, I feel. He really taught me how to do it because he did exactly what I told him. If you told him to stand on the head in the corner and do it, he'd do it. 
And that's how you get results with these. If somebody won't cooperate with you, you're barking up the wrong tree. You can't save all the starfish. You can save some, you can save the good ones, but you can't save all of them. So again, this is where he started off. And um, now we move into, in, into this, into upper airway resistance. I, um, uh, I can't remember why I did that transition. Um, but anyway, it goes down, you see the one here, and this is, this is the pulse rate, oh, I know. And here's the heart rate, which isn't normal. That's not normal for a 19 year old. And so that's how you get into the uh, natural history of a generic disease. And the same slide I showed you earlier, but there's one more thing I want to tell you about it. I found this incredibly fascinating. For four years, we'd be going along and about every six months, uh, within about four to six months, people would come back in and they were having TMJ problems. And I thought, well, what's wrong with my appliance? They're getting TMJ. That, they didn't have it before. So I didn't have this before. Why did you get it? I thought there was something wrong with the appliance. What it was is TM, uh, using the muscles to clear the airway is physiologic health. It's not, it's not a problem. It's physiologic health. The body's taking care of itself. And what I had done by holding people in this better state uh, of being with the oral appliance, even though they had obstructive sleep apnea, they healed and they moved back down into TMD. And when I figured that out, we just changed things up a little bit and their numbers were always better, but I couldn't figure out why they were having this pain. It was, it was just, they had regained TM, their, their muscle ability and their reflexes. So who is healthy? You know, well, you don't know. Who is healthy? The majority of men uh, begin to having sleep apnea in their 40s. The majority of women begin having it in their, in their 60s. Um, the prevalence of OSA, uh, AHI greater than five, is uh, with daytime sleepiness. It's shown here on this graph. This is about 10 to 12 studies that are put together. And you'll notice that men in most studies so go across, men by and large are worse than women by a considerable amount. And, and women get it in later in years. So here, I pulled out one study to show you, uh, women are in dark and men are in light gray. And you can see uh, that men stay way ahead of women, but they start to catch up in their 60s. And I'm not sure about this. The sample is pretty small for the 70s. I think this, this would probably, should be probably equal with men, but I'm not sure. But they lose their, that's the reason why they have TMD later in life. Men, it's pretty well gone by age 50. And women, can, you can get people into their 60s and 70s, and I've even had them in their 80s. But they're the ones that have preserved their reflexes, I believe. Now, here's my point. More men dying from COVID-19 than women, by far, in, in every country. Why is that? Well, men and women are the same worldwide, and uh, sleep apnea affects them more than it does women. Men are dying from uh, the coronavirus at a higher rates than women around the world. Men also have a higher rates of underlying pre-existing conditions, such as high blood pressure, diabetes. These make patients who uh, contract uh, coronavirus, coronavirus more vulnerable. And if you go back, uh, you know, the, the comorbidities are exactly these. The comorbidities that I described early on are exactly what they're saying here, you know, type 2 diabetes, hypertension. So even if you look who is healthy, if you look at men versus women, this is common cancers. You'll see that men have more cancers than women do if you kind of add them all up. And why is that? Well, if we're running sympathetic more, you can't heal. And I feel that's a real point. And this is, uh, uh, David Gazal did this, and it was a uh, 3 million people in this, in this paper. They divided into uh, 1.5 million, it's big data, between people without um, obstructive sleep apnea and people with sleep apnea. Type 2 diabetes was 2.29 times more prevalent. Arrhythmia is 3.26, ischemic heart disease 2.5, uh, stroke is 3.5, hypertension is high, depression is 5, uh, congestive heart failure is very high as well. 
So people who have obstructive sleep apnea are set up to be damaged by this virus. It's, it's what it amounts to. That's the trouble. So the cardiovascular disease confirmed cases uh, causing deaths in you know, cardiovascular disease far more than, you know, is the most. Uh, now, the, it, from Italy, it showed that 1% 1 1 of patients who died had no other disease. 26% had one, uh, up to 26% had one, 26% uh, had two diseases. This is wrong. I must have mistyped that. Uh, and 47% had three or more conditions. Most commonly pre-existing conditions are hypertension, ischemic heart disease, atrial fib, and active cancer within the past five years. Um, Several years ago. Uh, I mean, um, Jim, one of the things that's interesting about COVID too is that we're looking, when we're looking at this data coming out on COVID mortality rates around the world, that patients with calcium channel blockers on board that's one of the newer things that we're looking at too, that's causing uh, inflammatory processes in the lungs to be exacerbated. And even with proning the patients who've been vented or whatnot, they're finding that they're getting much more fluid inside the cells that's not flushing out. And if you've got ch channel blockers on board with um, a number of other medications that are not really establishing homeostasis in the patient, they're just masking symptoms so the patient can function, then that's where COVID is really uh, insidious in that it can get in underneath yeah. all of these other interventions medically that the patients have on board that are covering symptoms and yet not getting them back to a homeostatic, you know, where they're healthier and their inflammation is down. So yes. it's, that's really insidious. That's exactly right, Pat. It really is. And I, I you know, I'll be blatant. I think uh, mandibular advancement appliance and clearing up the airway and getting rid of inflammation and making somebody parasympathetic could very well protect somebody from, uh, from some stages of this disease process. Mm -hmm. I don't know what disease, uh, you know, that's a big statement. And I don't know what stages you can prevent it from, but I certainly think it's worth looking into. And I, I don't know how to do this, but uh, breathing is very important, obviously. And we can make people breathe better. And the CPAP doesn't do as good a job as we do. Okay, is AHI a good way to monitor airway deficiencies? Well, Avram Gold, I've had Ave here a couple times in Columbus to speak. And he showed early on, this was back in 2003, you notice that the, the graph with the white is its upper airway resistance. These people that are less than, uh, I, I think he did it at less than, less than 10. And uh, as it got mild to moderate and severe, that goes down. Headaches also dropped off as it got into severe. Uh, irritable bowel uh, dropped down because you're not getting quite as much epinephrine. Uh, bruxism started to drop. Um, there's a lot to do that. Uh, elderly are most at risk from the coronavirus. That's obvious. And, uh, you know, as that goes along, why is that? Well, our airway is really a tube. Uh, we breathe air in and it narrows down in our throat and then goes into our lungs. Well, this is a venturi. And that venturi causes a vacuum. And that vacuum, we don't only get floppy on the outside, we get floppy on the inside and that airway tends to close down more easily in elderly people than it does in, in the healthy young person. So age is a big problem with this, mainly because of Bernoulli's principle. And then there is the reference on that. Uh, you do not only get flabby on the outside, you get flabby on the inside. Piling on extra pounds speeds up the decline of lung function in older adults. While lung function decreases naturally as people age, Researchers linked moderate to significant weight gain to even in sharper de decline. So, you know, if you can keep somebody healthier uh, by keeping weight off, you're, you're going to be doing them a massive favor. I don't think this is going to be gone. Um, I, I think at least a third of the patients in your, in your practice have the need for obstructive sleep apnea treatment just because they have obstructive sleep apnea and they're not wearing a CPAP. You don't need to go out and get referrals from anybody. You've got them right there. If you have a thousand people in your practice, 
you could easily have 250 right there. And by the time you get through those 250, you'll be pretty good at it. And I'm always here to help on that. But we're, we're going to air, enter the era of the virus. And I think this is a protective mechanism that might help a lot of people. Uh, and I get the morning minute every morning from the ATS. And I, I do like the ATS as a group. If someone's real serious in this, you can talk to me about joining. I think it's a wonderful opportunity for a dentist. They've treated me beautifully. The coronavirus pandemic is likely to last as long as two years and won't be controlled until two thirds of the world's population is immune. Hey, Jim, and go ahead and uh, unplug that mic and replug one time. Okay. Thanks. Um, officials need to be prepared, uh, prepare the public for a prospective period of corona coronavirus resurgences over the next two years and your leaders, leaders to be uh, ready for the worst case, which is no vaccine. Um, we don't have a vaccine, we got something pretty good. So here's the Wisconsin cohort study. I love this study. And basically what it shows, if the apnea index is less than five, year at the, this was um, 1,522 people, uh, men, women, 30 to 60 years old. It was, was, it was a civil servants in Wisconsin. And basically if their happy index was less than five, the probability of them living 18 more years at the time of, of they got into the study was 90, uh, around 95%. If their happy index was five to 15, their probability is about 92. If their apnea index was about 15 to 30, it was about low 80s. But if you're greater than 30, that's a problem. Uh, we know for sure that, that kills people. I mean, there's very little that is totally known in the world of sleep medicine, but AHIs greater than 30 do kill people. Instituting this into a dental office. This needs to be a cookbook, an absolute cookbook. I mean, you pick this up, you, you, you know, there's no, there's no, uh, th nothing like experience. And experience is, there's no substitute. So if you're gonna learn to dive, uh, the one on the left, the little girl was not the guy on the right. What my goal is by teaching you the basics of mandibular advancement therapy is that I can jump you over these two middle steps and put you right to the end goal. And that's my, that's my goal. So let's go through that. Let's take a look at these couple crowns. Pretty good crowns, they're not bad. I think they're beautiful. Are those crowns good? We know that crown's not good and the one is. We know that that's a beautiful crown. And we know that the, the over-contoured uh, cr uh, anterior crown on the left is not good compared to the one in the, uh, to the right. We know that. So what I want you to do is start using your dental knowledge. So these are, uh, let's see, how many are I make? Eight appliances. And I lay these out on the table. Only one of them is right. Uh, seven of them are wrong. And seven of them will increase the AHI by at least 10. The other one will treat it well. So I, uh, I in 35 seconds, I put the, uh, Bill, was, uh, Pete was here, and I put them in front of him. And he took his finger and he went around. He went around like this with his finger for 35 seconds. I wish I'd have filmed it. I really wish I'd have filmed it. And he picked the right one out in 35 seconds. What was he looking at? He was looking at contour. He's looking at shape. He was looking at all the things that a good crown is. There's nothing more. He, he was looking for what was thin, what, what seemed to match anatomy. You know, that, and in 35 seconds, he picked out the right one. Nobody else, I've, I can let people look at those things for an hour and nobody will figure it out. But you got to apply because they think they're different. They're not different. They're what we've worked with our entire lives. But I do wish I'd filmed that. That was astounded me. Apply your existing knowledge of dentistry. You already know much of what you need. You really do. The idea about thinness and uh, and not no bulk and making it fit a patient well. All those things that you do in your regular practice and the HED promotes is what you need to know. 
This is my paper, uh, High Resolution Pulse Oximetry and Titration Mandibular Advancement Device for Obstructive Sleep Apnea. The rest of the talk will be pretty much about this. And if you, uh, you can download it from Frontiers in Neurology, METS High Resolution, if you just type that into the browser. Uh, it, it, to my knowledge, it's the only clinical paper that's been published medically in a peer-reviewed journal. So anyway, I'm pretty proud of it. We worked on it for five years. The people involved with it were Jair Atarian. He was at Northwestern. The IRB was under him. Uh, Mickey is, uh, does a good job of, he works and helps me with all the ref references. Dr. Jim Blank is, uh, is my partner. Uh, Chris Takis is, is the person that does a lot of the work up in the la uh, operatory. Dale Smith was our, was our statistician. And a lot of you know David Gazal. He, was the, he is the G number one sleep researcher in the world. Um, would this be an attractive way to provide predictably superior care for your patient? Treatment time required three appointments. 80, 90, 80 to 90% of your patient would get to an AHI of less than 10, most to less than five. Total office time, 90 minutes to 120. Appointments, digital impressions, and I'm working only with digital. I don't, uh, we have a small uh, research laboratory here and we do not uh, work with anything but digital any longer because they're so incredibly accurate. Uh, insertion of the appliance, it, it's, it takes 10, 10 minutes to put it in. And so that's the second appointment. I say 60 minutes because you're talking to the patient the most. You bring him back for a check at 30, min uh, 30 minutes. And in the process, you adjust the appliance. I'll show you how to do that. And then you get him back in for three months check for the first year every, every three months because you gotta look for occlusion changes, and I'll talk about that too. Three months uh, for the first year, just to make sure that they're not gonna change. Or if they're gonna change, it's gonna be mild. So where are we? Where are we in dental sleep medicine? I'd say we've just taken off. We're doing pretty good. But if you want to get sleep physicians involved, hand them my paper, they believe in data. They have more, way more data driven than we as dentists are. And give them the paper and tell them, this is what I can do for you. And they'll like it because they'll like the outcome studies. Because Gazal made sure they were good. <laughs> he, beat me up, he beat me up pretty good on everything we did. Uh, the anterior appliance is what we use to control bite change. And, and uh, for TMD, this really does a remarkable job. If people wear it in the morning, you don't have callbacks because of TMD and it just makes everything go simpler. But it's small, and one of the, I never can understand, I've used this for 30 years, it's basically Bill McCorris' appliance, I've modified it, but it's basically Bill's. And um, I never understood why it works so well. It's because it doesn't take up tongue space. That's why it works so well, and I never understood that. Uh, it's easy to make, it's quick. High patient acceptance can be worn 24 seven, except when you eat. And it's non-porous, there's no plastic, it's more durable, and it's self-adjusting. In other words, without the posterior teeth being in contact, they, uh, it moves up and back. Now, you're gonna say, well, that'll give uh, anterior open bite. Well, I hear that all the time, and that's a, that's a big discuss discussion, but it really doesn't. You're really seeing the occlusion as it really is. But what's interesting is I only keep people in these appliances now for about eight to 10 weeks, and then we move them into a mandibular advancement device. So long-term care is not a bite plane any longer in my office. And they are diagnostic. And they're sort of magic. <laughs> People like them a lot. We make a lot of them. So instituting sleep into your dental practice and beyond. Well, we're at the genesis down here. Uh, this is where it pretty much is. We do two or three or four or five a month or one a month or one every three months or whatever. But there is one billion people in the world that need our care. And in the United States alone, 100 million. And it's never going to be addressed that way. So we need to move it to a commodity level. So it can be done easily. And it gets into dollars. When you're at the genesis level, it's expensive. It costs a lot. The, the cost needs to come down, and, and, uh, and it will. I promise that. And uh, this, David and I have talked a lot about it. So 
considering uh, before if you're really serious about getting into this and Pete says that you know in a flip of a switch you know whether you're going to do this or not you don't know everything but you know you're going to do it so it's like turning on light so if you've turned on the light consider incorporating sleep TMD practice as a separate entity from your restorative practice then as you get older or else if you want to transition it you can sell your restorative practice and keep the TMD practices which is what I sort of done Here's the appliance. It basically has two buttons on the upper. The, this is the back one and this is the front one. I'll show you more detail on this. And there's one, there's one pivot down on the bottom. Uh, we move the jaw forward 3.5 millimeters from the laboratory. And the arm is non-adjustable. It's not rigid like this. I'll show you what it looks like, but it's not rigid, but it is non-adjustable. You think, well, how can that possibly work? Well, what we're gonna do is we're gonna move it forward to the second button, and that protrudes the mandible at seven millimeters. That puts us into what we call anatomic norms, and I'll show you the data that drives that. Rubber bands. People talk about rubber bands. How long do you need to wear rubber bands? You need to rubber, wear rubber bands forever. Uh, you can't not wear rubber bands for these appliances, because what happens is, if you have the apnea index or AHI perfectly controlled, you won't have a problem, but if you don't have a perfect control, the, the patient will open and move and brux. So this is a paper that was done in France or in Belgium in 2017. And what it shows is a, it's a graph that shows as the AHI goes up, the apnea index goes up, jaw movement goes up. So jaw movement is a direct correlation to, uh, to the esophageal pressure which drives sleep apnea. I, I go, I spend about an hour on this when we do it in our regular courses, but this is a really important graph and it really shows about jaw opening and I never did understand that until this paper came out. Movement of the jaw is caused by sympathetic activity. So whenever you're getting a lot of jaw movement and need rubber bands, the sympathetic activity is not totally controlled and you'll never totally control it. You can't totally control it. I can't totally control it. I'm, I, I, I do well, but I can't, I can't do it perfectly on every person. I usually have bar straws uh, when, we, when we do the course. These straws right here. And I get people four of them. And you might want to do this. If I'd have known who was going to be on the call, I'd have sent them to you. But you, you take four of them. Anybody knows me, I've always got straws in my pocket. And you put them between your mouth. Hold your nose and breathe in. And what you'll find is it's pretty easy to breathe with four straws, but then take one away. Gets much harder. Take two away, much harder yet. So each one of these straws is, is just seven square millimeters. That's seven square millimeters there. And so 14 square millimeters makes a huge difference. So whenever I'm making my oral appliance, I'm always thinking about giving back another seven square millimeters. And that will mean that I have to advance the patient less. So here's the back end view of a mandibular advancement appliance. And here's the nose. So what is the similarity between those? Well, you got to make room for the tongue in this space. So let's talk about that a little bit. First of all, dentists love symmetry. Get away from symmetry. Symmetry, you follow exactly the contours of the teeth, just like you would if you're going to make a crown. You don't make every crown exactly the same, but they have all the same attributes. So make sure that you don't make everything symmetrical. For some reason, we think that's going to work better. It doesn't. So this is space available, and this is space available between the two. So we're going to put the tongue into this. So this is seven square millimeters, and that's seven square millimeters right there. I, I fix that so it would be. And so now let's look at the rest of the mouth. Let's draw around. That is the space available for the tongue. And in the mouth, it has this space available. So why would you put acrylic back there? The tongue is going to take advantage of that. There's more there's more nerve tissue in the tongue than there is in the bottom half of the body. It's going to take care of that. Why would you put acrylic here right in the back over the molars? Pat taught me this. I, I, I say it's the McBride effect. 
you know, we go in and we brightify it. That's what we say when we cut off the molars. That's getting a little advanced, but she taught me how to do that. Now, why would you put plastic there? There's no reason. Why would you extend the borders down further than they need to go? Why would you make them bulkier than they need to be? Why would you extend this up into the palate any further than for stability? There's no need. Also, you got it on the on the person side. You got to look at the adenoids and see if they're in place. Uh, and then you have the back of the throat where the tonsils are. Those need to be taken out or are resolved. You have the epiglottis. It gets floppy and falls backwards. So you need to sleep on your left side only. Uh, you have acid reflux that comes up from the stomach and that swells and inflames the tissue. You have a hyoid bone. It's like the wishbone of a, of a turkey. And that's what we pull forward with the genohyoid muscle, genioglossus. So how do I know whether something is working or not? I wear this pulse oximeter, like I've talked before. And uh, we do three nights in a row and then see how we see how the patient is doing. So we developed, based on the, this METS appliance, it costs less than CPAP. It's proven now, it's predictable, it's easy to use. We have a paper on it. Uh, it's FDA cleared, Medicare approved, patented, trademarked, all that stuff. But read about it in the paper and the details are there. So this is what we did on a lateral step. An 80%, 50 to 80% increase in the breathing area. The breathe tube is bigger, it's simple. That's what I say to patients. So uh, efficiency and variation. This is going back to Kate Sutherland and Peter Sestouli again on another one of their papers. They published a lot. They did 425 obstructive sleep apnea patients. It's a single research center. No upper limit for apnea hypopnea index. We did not have an upper limit on our study either. Our body mass index, we did not have an upper level. We had some people that were 45 BMIs. Maximum, but what they did that I did not do is they did maximum, they called a comfortable protrusion limit. Each, um, I asked Peter because it's not defined in the paper, which annoys me when they don't put this in the, in the uh, systems part of the paper of how they do it. And I said, how did, you, how did you titrate the appliance? He said, we cranked it forward until the patient said uncle. So you pulled it as far forward as you possibly could. So that's not a good thing. The duration of the study was about a month or six weeks, I think. It wasn't a very long study. And for every millimeter, you bring this jaw forward. It's 125 grams of force on the teeth. So if you bring it forward six millimeters, it's going to put, uh, you know, 700 or so grams of force on the teeth. If you put it forward 10 millimeters, it's going to put 1,250 grams of force on the, on the teeth. And it, it, it's the, so you want to have the least protrusion possible get the desired result to keep the patient's occlusion under control. So let's look at their, let's look at their results. And uh, I just popped mine up. In mild, they had 52 uh, for AHI less than five. We got an 81%, they got a 52%. And this is, these are numbers at the end of one year. This is at the end of a very short period. Uh, moderate, we got 90% of, and severe, we got 47%. To less than 10, we got 93% of people to less than 10. We got 100% of the moderates to less than 10. And we got 73% of the spheres to less than 10. Uh, they define also is a 50% or greater reduction. And they uh, we got 53, 52%, I got 93 on milds. Uh, we got 100% on moderates and 95% on severes for 50% or greater improvement. So, Let's look at that, block that off. So I've got to do a little fireworks here. For entire, for the, for the uh, entire group, the cohort, we got 66.3% uh, of people to less than five of all severities, and they got 36.5. And uh, less than 10, they got 52, I got 87. And to greater than 50, they got 63 and I got 97. Now, now, what's really important is, is I didn't take people out till they said uncle. So that's a definite improvement. And that's CPAP or better equivalency because these patients were all CPAP failures or 85% of them were CPAP failures approximately. So now let's look at protrusion. Uh, it's interesting, you have uh, 
active protrusion is the blue line here on the bottom right. It's how far you can push the jaw forward. In the red line is how far you can drag the jaw forward. And so I wanted to know um, what the normal maximum protrusion was. And so I did a research and it's interesting, Julian Wolfel, he was a patient of mine and an instructor. He was the dental, uh, dental anatomy person at Ohio State and Dr. Hirashi. Uh, I, I knew Wolf, Dr. Wolfel very, very well and I did a reconstruction on him. And anyway, his paper popped up because he was so, I gave him a GV Black book once and he went through and found all the errors in GV Black. It was amazing, he gave me a, a rata sheet on it. Uh, but maximum protrusion, what Dr. Wolfel found was uh, eight millimeters as a mean, maximum was 13, and minimum was 2.5. So you're dealing with a range there. So let's look at that. Now, I'm, I've switched studies. This is the Massey study. And to give you an idea of, because Peter did not give the, the, the protrusion rates on his paper, which uh, I think he should have. It would have made a difference. But what you see here is on maximum protrusion on this T2 is this uh, second appointment. They're at 10.8, uh, 10.8, 10.7, 11.9, and 9.9, with maximum is out as far as 16.8, 16.8, 11.7. So they're really out there. And um, so that's pretty significant. And our average, our max is 7.5. And so we were, le were less than what Dr. Wolfel said was the mean, which is eight millimeters. And right now we're, we're actually putting it at seven because we've thinned the appliance a little bit with new materials. And so we've backed off just a bit. And this, this data will not work for any other appliance. It's, the appliances are like they have a fingerprint. And so what I'm giving you is data for this appliance. And the compliance at the end of one year was 92%, which is significant way higher in CPAP. So again, uh, here's, here's another Sestouli paper. And we had a difference in vertical dimension of occlusion. I found that that was incredibly important. But here's a paper in 2002 that said the effect of bite opening in, induced uh, by a manipulator advancement splint on efficiency and side effects in the treatment of sleep apnea. And basically it said, the study suggests the amount of bite opening induced in a med uh, does not have a significant impact on the treatment efficiency, but does not, but does have an impact on patient acceptance. Well, they weren't doing as well. You, you need to track things. And when you're only tracking with, with in-lab PSG, it's a problem. If you have a pulse oximeter, you can track. I, I, I've done 17 to 25 nights of study on some people just to see what was going on. <laughs> he measured the vertical dimension here in the front, a minimum of four and a maximum of 14. So he did one at four and one at 14 and said, so the vertical didn't matter. The anterior, the anterior opening is highly variable with, with the anterior overlap. We changed positions and I, I didn't stick with that. We went to the premolar to premolar, uh, cuss tip to cuss tip and used a bowling gauge to measure right there. And we found theirs to be six millimeters in that range. That is beyond the range of our appliance. We did not have to go, uh, the average was four, four millimeters. And so six would be on range. So this was their minimum. So they were already beyond range when they started. So it's not, it's not a very good paper. It's outside the treatment range. So let's go back to this. Make room for the tongue, space available. And that's our goal. That's really what we got to do. And you saw how bulky that appliance was. That just does, doesn't do well. It takes up room for the tongue and the seven square millimeters. Think about that straw and just adding room for the straw. So here is the real gold in my whole study. I was sitting here in this very room in the library and I was really frustrated because Gazal told me that I had, I had to uh, make, I need to make this so it was more uh, scalable. And so, I, I didn't know what to do. I tried all kinds of things. I checked the gonio angle. I, I, he didn't want me to use the CEF uh, radi radiography either. And so I sat down and I plotted the people out in vertical and horizontal. And these are all the responders, the people who went to less than five. They're in this little tight range. I couldn't believe it. 
everybody adjusted the same, whether they were male, female, young, old, tall, thin, heavy, not heavy. Um, and so what we do is we set our appliance at about six and a half, about, oh, about six and a half to seven is where we're setting the appliance. We're still refining that just a little bit. So that is the real goal. We actually know where a treatment range is. And so it doesn't need to be titrated. If you just set it to the outside of the treatment range, you're going to catch this whole group. Now, bring up the Massey study again. So what he wrote is, see, he was all over the map. He was clear out to 16, and his vertical was clear way off the map that way. He never saw this, this, this anatomic norm because they weren't very carefully titrated. Every appliance, if they're made consistently, will titrate to an anatomic norm, if they're made consistently. But it's, it's hard to find. It takes a lot of careful work, and I don't think you can do it without the high-resolution pulse oximeter. So you go back. A vertical does matter. What's important, the oral appliance uh, is the most predictable, successful method thus far published. Uh, makes your care simple and can be delegated. Uh, once patient has accepted care, only three 30-minute appointments to complete. Uh, reduce cost to the patient, uh, can, and you can do better that way too because it doesn't take up chair time. Can be done in mass quantities, and it really can. Uh, when I was in China, uh, the head of the hospital said he loved our appliance. I made it on 20 physicians in his hospital. He said, Jim, these are great. We want to make a thousand of them a month. And I had no idea how to do that. And so for the last seven or eight years, that's been in the back of my head, along with, with uh, Dr. Grisal pushing me pretty hard. Laboratories are allowed to make these appliances however they please. Now, if you give a laboratory free reign on making a crown, what are you going to come up with? You're going to end up with crap. And Today in sleep medicine, that's exactly they are allowed to do just that. You need to be as diligent with these as you are with your curl gold crowns or your uh, your occlusion or the way your denture is made. This is far more critical than any of those things. So here's uh, this is a pretty interesting part of my presentation. I really like it. Um, this is how this is a, a line graph that shows how we pretty much went to less than five on most people, and and this is uh, less, you know, 15, and there's less than 30. So we only left two people above 30, which is pretty amazing out of 101 people. So mild, moderate, severe. So we changed people a lot by doing this. So this is normal ranges. And that's the CPAP definition of success. And that's what Dr. Gazal demanded. But this is also success if you bring it down, if you lower the numbers. So we got a 97.8% success for severity patients to less than 50% reduction and 87 to less than 10 and 66.3 to less than five. Now, let's go back to that Wisconsin cohort. This is really interesting. Now I wanna apply our figures to the Wisconsin cohort based on that study. So what I did is I flipped my graph upside down and I took it to the ranges. And this is where we normalize people where they have 96% survival rate. That, that's amazing. Out of that 101 people, this number got to that range. And to get to less than 10, they're still, look at most of them are, 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 less, than, are, are less than 10 or 15. It's amazing. And there's only one or two left here in the severe range, really only one. And um, uh, that person needs more care. Um, nasal uh, nose can really make a difficult problem for you, but I really don't recommend having nasal surgery done until you would, I'd like to talk to you individually about that if you want to hear. We've kept data on that too, but I haven't published it yet. So be part of the new world. Consider, really consider the impact you're making. If you make a thick denture or whatever, it's going to it's going to impact somebody's sleep if they don't if they leave it in at night. Or if you make a, a bulky hybrid, it's going to it's going to impact somebody's sleep. You need to make these hybrids as thin as you possibly can. Uh, you need to make your crown bridge so it doesn't extend into the lingual. Uh, concrete levels of change in which you're involved, sociologic, 
psychologic, historical, demographic, and you're making a real difference in this world. So this is the way the old arm adjusted. It's kind of a pain. This is made by Shoy. Uh, it also, we had four people out of the 136 people, that was the total cohort, uh, that were actually allergic to this because of nickel. And so we gold plated them, we put uh, fingernail polish on them, we did all kinds of things. This is Chris, I'm letting him shake. Then you had to turn this jack screw down to, to get it to lock. They're a real pain because they lost adjustments and they bent. So this is the way we adjust the appliance now. Chris is going to pick up a little bit of wax. This is just periphery wax or ortho wax. You put it in the hole and screw the screw. See how he said it's a little shaky this morning. I noticed I made him do it instead of me. And you move it forward to there. and the appliance is adjusted. That's it, you do it on the other side, that's it, near normal anatomic ranges. That'll be seven millimeters of advancement. This is uh, maximum intercuspation here. These, num these lines light up, line up at maximum intercuspation, and that's the advancement we have forward. Now, you can see that the uh, Shoy arm has a neural screw on here uh, for adjustment, and our arm is solid and it's made out of a surgical stainless steel that the same thing they make hip joints out of. And like I said, I had trouble with allergy with this and I, this is a, about four times stronger, so I have less trouble with breakage. And if you pick up the Shoy arm first, you can take it in your hands and if you've got one laying around, just do this, it's kind of amazing. Just take it. It's so easy to bend. Done. That one's toast. That was easy. Now, I know this is not Instrum tested, but Chris is going to do it on the new arm that we made. And to date, we have not had one arm break. It's considerably stronger. You can bend it, but it's hard. That's, when those things bend, and the Shoy arm bends, and you have to replace, that costs you $100 because the patient doesn't want to pay for it. So all this is about reducing cost to you and improving care for the patients. So this is space available, and that's all you got right there. Now, why would you put plastic over the incisal edges? There's no need, you have the teeth contained. And so why would you put plastic back here? Why would you put plastic back here? You don't need it. Why would you put a thickness of plastic there other than minimal thickness? It makes no sense to make that a millimeter thick. You add a millimeter of plastic to that and run a pulse oximeter, you will, you will see about a 10, uh, 10 increase in the AHI. Makes no sense. Or extending this way up and building this all up with plastic is a problem. So here's an unhappy person that comes in all we did was move it forward, and there she is. I mean, it, she, she dropped to a three. I mean, it just, it was easy. Sleep disorders, you know, impotence, memory loss, lung hypertension, stroke, headache, heart attack, arrhythmias, diabetes, fatigue, drowsiness, hypertension, obesity, those are all sleep disorders. But sleep disorders is not the center. We've always put it at the center, it's not. Let's put it off the side. The real boogeyman here is the sympathetic activation. That causes the sleep disorders too. So that should be at the key, the center of the wheel. Sympathetic activation is a problem and it's not well controlled by CPAP. A major step forward was a, was a scanner. We have a TRIOS 3 now and it really makes it a difference. We can put these appliances in in 10 minutes. It takes us about four minutes to scan. The TRIOS 3 and the ITERO seem to be the best based on, uh, on my research anyway, but uh, we've worked with both of them and they work well and they have to be printed well. Your lab can't use a printer they bought at Hobby Lobby. It's got to print 
high, to a high degree of accuracy. The, it, it can't be a, a $2,000 printer, I don't think, uh, unless I haven't checked for a while. But anyway, it's a very good way of doing things. Now the real balm is to elevate the head and sleep on the left side. And this is called the Medcline pillow. It's available on Amazon. I cannot sleep without this thing. You sleep on your left side and you with the pillow in between your knees and it, and it gives a slot for your arm. Because I was sleeping on my left side for several years and I actually lost the use of my left shoulder a bit. And now it's, I've worked that out and it's back to normal. But this, I, I just feel great when I wake up in the morning. This thing elevates the head and controls gastric reflux. It was invented by a gastroenterologist. I saw it the, at the ATS meeting and I've recommended it to everybody. First two weeks, you have a little bit of trouble with it. Uh, you'll get a little bit of pain in your hip. Probably I did. And I just tell you, get over it. You know, take some ibuprofen, but just keep at it. It'll go away. You know, don't give up on the pillow because you really do need it. It gives you a lot of benefit. Now, this is a little tedious, but I think you really need to hear it. Uh, and I did it exactly from the literature, so I didn't, I didn't put a spin on it. Pulmonary manifestations of gastric reflux disease. GERD may cause or trigger or exacerbate many pulmonary diseases. So if you sleep with your head elevated you, and you decrease the GERD, you're going to have less trouble with many pulmonary diseases. The physiological link between GERD and pulmonary disease has been extensively studied in chronic cough and asthma. And if you control it, and, you, and there's ways that the oral appliance controls it too, and I could talk about that, but I don't have it in my talk. Uh, a primary care physician often encounters patients with extra esophageal uh, manifestations or GERD in the absence of heartburn. And a lot of people have, 50% uh, of people have no pain. Now, if you do this uh, manifestations, a clinical view, uh, you'll get non-cardiac chest pain, ear, nose, and throat disorders, indigestion, chest discomfort, throat symptoms, bitter taste, throat irritation, post-nasal drip, hoarseness, recurrent cough, chest congestion, lung inflammation. All those things are, are, are in the literature. Conclusions and relevance. The avoidance of proton pump inhibitors, uh, which is um, a result of the, you know, the, um, the, to control GERD. If you read the, 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 uh, the bottle, they say you should use them no longer than two weeks. And the avoidance of PPI medication may prevent the development of dementia. This uh, finding is supported by recent pharmacological analysis on primary data and is in line with mouse models in which the use of PPIs increased the beta amyloid brains in mice. This was in JAMA. Beta amyloid, this is from Alzheimer's Association. Uh, brain cells that produce, store, and retrieve information degenerate and die. That's Alzheimer's. One primary suspect creating this destruction is a microscopic brain protein fragment called beta amyloid, a sticky compound that accumulates in the brain, disrupting communication between the brain cells and eventually killing them. Some researchers believe that flaws in the process governing production, accumulation, or disposal of beta amyloid are the primary causes of Alzheimer's. This is called the amyloid hypothesis. So, just a little bit more time. I call it dentistry's moonshot. And we have a patient, uh, Keith, with an AHI of 37. These are two separate PSGs. His SpO2 or oxygen dropped to 78, which is low. And this is interesting about vertical dimension. How do you establish vertical dimension? For years, I, I, I deal with provisional restorations. You kind of do it like this. Well, that looks about right. Aesthetics looks right. The angles look right. You know, the uh, space looks side, the buckle space looks okay. So how would you decide? Why I did it five and a half millimeters. How did I decide that the vertical dimension increase was 5.5 millimeters? I did it with a pulse oximeter. I varied the, the provisionals. Uh, from, and this was him in habitual occlusion and at 5.5, and I did thin the linguals of the uh, provisionals too, and I thinned the linguals on the, um, on the completed uh, restorations. But I was able to change his habitual occlusion uh, with this 5.5 millimeter increase. That was all I did. So when you do reconstructive uh, dentistry, 
you really are impacting the AHI and we don't even know it. When people complain about something, are they bruxing more or this or that, we don't understand why. It's the vertical. If you decrease the vertical or there's a, or you made it bulky and they're not sleeping well, they're, they're bruxing more. So this, that pulse oximeter tells me a ton. So here he is pre-treatment, there he is post-treatment. So it's not perfect, but he's an 11 now. He's not a severe anymore. So here's uh, restricted airflow, fright flight. On the top, a patient came in and before and after, uh, this is a different patient. Uh, this is what she looked like. These little drops right here are not real. These marks right here tell you that they're, they're air because the patient rolled over. And whenever a patient rolls over with a pulse oximeter, it like it, it's like somebody's having a heart attack or something. So they moved from the top to the bottom and they came in as a TMD patient and they were an AHI of 27. So if I hadn't picked them up with a pulse ox, they would have been a sleep apneic that we'd have covered up the symptoms on and they'd have gotten nothing but worse. Back to the survival rate. And this normalization is really important. You can do a lot of good for your patients. And I can't overstate this. This is the greatest thing. And these are the major disease processes occurring with deficient airway. Uh, everything from obesity to congestive heart failure, type 2 diabetes, atrial fib, coronary artery disease, stroke, depression, metabolic syndrome, all these things are connected. So this is what we did with Pete. Um, and the conclusion, the Mets appliance is the only proven simple solution to sleep apnea. Uh, uh, it's easy to use, good for business, good for your patients. So I'm always looking for a starfish. So anyway, it was a pleasure. Thank you, Dr. Matt. Oh, I guess we're getting a little feedback there. Um, uh, Dr. Ross is going to handle the Q&A here for us. Uh, Dr. Ross, go ahead and unmute yourself. And uh, uh, I'd like to see how you boiled down 36 questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there were quite a few to be sure. Um, can you hear me all right? Yes. And yes it's a big start, topic. Dude. It's a big topic. Tried, please jump in uh, whenever you want. Yes, so, indeed. All right. Uh, so, Jim uh, and Pat, could you talk uh, more about the left side sleeping, um, you know, and um, would any intraoral condition change your recommendation on left side sleeping? No. Um, let, me, let me change the angle of my camera a little bit. Uh, I always envision the stomach like a, like a bottle. Let me bring it down a little bit. It's like a bottle. And when you're on your left side, the bottle is standing up. We're in your right side, it's upside down and the acid can run out of it. So the idea of you sleeping on your left side stands the bottle up and so you have less trouble with gastric reflux. And then with your head elevated, I learned this from a plumber, it runs downhill. You know, if you have your head elevated, the, the acid stays in the stomach better. I can't begin to tell you how much this has helped me. Uh, some people don't need an oral appliance, they can be controlled with a pillow. Uh, you know, you get them off their stomach, get them off their right side, and all of a sudden they're doing great. Fantastic. Several questions about side effects uh, with the medieval advancement device um, as far as alterations in tooth position or TMD symptoms. Uh, what types of changes do you make to that appliance if symptoms develop? Uh, basically none. <laughs> um, um, the, the interesting thing about TMD you, you, you have a choice when you have one of these appliances made. You know, when you bring it forward, uh, about one person in 20, the jaw is gonna take off on you. And, but if you wear the mandibular, wear the anterior appliance in the morning, most people stay pretty stable. Uh, I was able to keep, keep Pete pretty stable that way. And you know, I wanted to keep his occlusion in good shape. And, uh, he was open a little bit in the back, but not badly. But then again, I, I get people that have massive changes. I mean, they'll come forward three or four millimeters. And, you know, I've thought a lot about that. And I thought, you know, that's really, that's really a blessing. It's not a problem. You know, it's like getting a mandibular advancement for free. I mean, it's, it's pretty amazing. I've had people who had an AHI, and I can show this in, in, if we want to do another seminar. Uh, they came in with an AHI in the 20s. And they wore the appliance for three years 
and they got one of these big jaw movements and they were uh, four with their appliance and five without it in. So they had actually fixed the problem on them almost like Rick does with his, with his uh, orthodontics. I mean, they didn't like the looks of things, but they sure were healthier. So is, 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 the, is, the, is the jaw moving out a blessing or a curse? I think it's a blessing myself. And what you do, the reason I tell you to do it every three months, you got to have the patient's permission. Say, they say, well, I don't like this. I don't like it at all. I, you know, all right. and they get in this and then they're, I'm not running on anybody, but their general dentist says, oh, it's open up a contact. Don't you wear that thing anymore. You're catching food there. What's more important, living or catching food between your teeth? I mean, you know, break it down to it. And the, so what, you need to talk to patients about it. So what I tell them is you've got a choice. You know, we can get rid of the oral appliance and you can go back on CPAP. Oh, no, I don't want to do that. I just want you to do this. I said, you don't get both. You get one or you get the other. Yeah. Now, the idea with TMD, using the anterior appliance, the little anterior appliance, I really don't have much trouble with TMD. If uh, I make one of those with every mandibular advancement device that goes out, uh, and that's really, really, really helped. Probably knocked down the TMD complaint by at least 70 or 80%. Yeah. But there's things about using some medications that I can't talk about in a quick seminar like this. Um, I don't even want to bring it up. I brought it up on the two day, you know, that can. Right. But I, it, it's, it, it gets people in trouble. Yeah, I think you're right. Jim, I think, Jim, one of the things that uh, the first question, too, we forgot to mention was um, for those of you who are just beginning to look at sleep and just beginning to evaluate your patients, when you have a patient who comes in with dental sequelae, they've got lots of caries that are erosion areas and they're predominantly on one side or the other. That's the side that the patient is sleeping on. And so if you see lots of carious lesions where you're like, well, how the heck did that get there? And they don't have anything on the opposing side. That's a good indicator that you need to be looking at their sleep. You need to be looking at whether or not their GERD is, is a symptom of uh, inflammation, whether it's part of breathing disorders or whatever, but that's a real good indicator to you as a dentist to start looking at the teeth, to start opening the door and the window to their airway. Indeed. And I've done, actually, what can I add to that? I've done reconstructions all, most of my career. And those are the people that need reconstructions. Why, do, why are they so broken down? The part that I didn't go that into is when they go into sympathetic mode at night, it also knocks down salivation. So as soon as you knock down salivation, then the acid is gonna have more effect on the teeth, on periodontal disease, uh, their teeth are gonna break down. So those are usually the people you're doing reconstructions on. Right. Exactly. Yep. Bill Robbins' presentation yesterday really addressed ways to, to build those patients up as you're going into that. So I encourage everybody else to look back at that. There's a question here, can you make an appliance on a class three occlusion? Sure. Yeah, you can, you can make a place of anybody, I swear. I haven't found, I have always been able to find oh, it. The mic's uh, going out again, and I'm up like a replug your mic if you don't mind, Jim. Thanks. Can you hear me again? Yes, perfect. This stupid mic, I tell you. <laughs> I'm going to, you can't buy anything new anymore. <laughs> you bought all this stuff. It's all gone. It's all gone. This is something I've had three or four years. I'm sorry, Ken. On the, on the class three occlusion, any yeah. alterations? Yeah. You can make it. You can make it. Uh, you need at least 10 good teeth on the top and 10 good teeth on the bottom. If you don't have those, put in a couple implants on the top and a couple one on the bottom, and then you can use those, and that'll stabilize against the teeth. Um, you, you can find ways of making it work on everybody. Yeah. Really good question here. What do you? What about the compliant CPAP patient? Do they still need an appliance if they're wearing their CPAP all the time? No, and I will never talk them out of it. But they, you know, there is Nicholas Netzer used to be the editor of the Sleep and Breathing Journal. I talked to him really early on in this, and he said, Jim, this isn't a uh, contest between CPAP and an oral appliance. You know, I think they should really have both. Because if somebody travels, or like me, I like to climb a mountain, I took, I took my mandibular advancement appliance up with me. I mean, I, I, that's what I do. I, and what's funny is I shoveled snow underneath my tent to make it like a, that wedge pillow I have. So I had my head elevated by 12 inches. I do all this stuff all the time. And um, it, it's really, it, it, it's, 
it's what you do. Yeah, gotcha. Um, interesting question here. Does taking the, uh, looking at the airway space in a CBCT take it in the supine position help you understand the condition? Not a bit. No, CBCT is not a good, uh, it doesn't show soft tissue at all well. It shows it very poorly. And it's over a 15 second period of time. And matter of fact, they're selling this and tracing out the airway and it's, it's baloney. It just is, uh, you know, just like Pete, you, you know, it looked like he had an airway off the CBCT that you could drive a tank through. We obviously didn't, I show you his talk, I showed him that. We had a, I had a discussion about his uh, because I couldn't find a good Seth to work with. And uh, cephalometry is really the best way to set these appliances up. Um, that takes me a while to teach somebody and I actually, you need to come to the office if you want to learn how to do that. I can teach you how to do it absolutely predictably. I can get a great set, but it's, it's, it, it's the reason why I've, I've kind of moved on beyond the CEPHs and all that because people just don't do it or they don't have a CEPH. And so this idea of just advancing out to seven millimeters, it's just a dream. It's just, it's just been great. Yeah. If that, there was a question about that. That's is that from centric relation moving forward seven millimeters? Oh, you know, it's funny. Pete and I had that same discussion. He says, "Is it centric relation or max meter cuspation?" And I might not have got as we, we talked about that at breakfast. <laughs> and, and I, I, I think you know, I had a pretty tight range. You know, it didn't vary over a very. It only ranged from about four out to about out to about seven. But I think that range would have been tighter if I went off a of centric relation instead of habitual occlusion. Because, you know, um, um, Pacell showed that the average protrusion is between, a you know, slide is from one millimeter out to, I think he said two and a half or 1.5. I can't remember what she said, but he wasn't even very good at getting centric relation. And, uh, you know, if you go back from centric relation, that might really tighten up this graph tremendously. So I, I don't know, but it's, it's a great question. Yeah. How does menopause affect sleep, the sleep apnea patient? I had that in here and I took it out. <laughs> you know, I have, I have all these slides of menopause. That really fascinates me because it gets in. You, I, I got to tell you now. <laughs> um, as men, you know, we were the hunter gatherers. And the idea that we were of value to the tribe to we're about, we, we got beat up with the saber-toothed tiger and the mastodon and all that stuff, to we were about 40, and then we really weren't much account. So we got sleep apnea and away we went. Uh, a woman can stay fertile in, until uh, up to age 51. And so the idea that she would have to take care of this child until it became of age and, you know, um, you know puberty or whatever, that would be another 12 years. So that would make it 63 based on the most, the longest numbers. And that's when just about when menopause, uh, the mean of menopause is. So it, you know, the, the body keeps the reflexes alive as long as they need to be there. We just beat them up. And women have a much more robust anatomic nervous system than we do. Yep. Does the uh, pulse oximeter that the patient wears at home calculate the AHI? No, it can by definition. But what's really interesting is the, I, I've used all kinds of home sleep testing units. The, the one that comes the closest to matching AHI is the pulse oximeter, the high resolution pulse oximeter and patient safety, because I've tested everything. There's nothing I don't think I have. I mean, I've tasted, tested a lot. And the HSTs are really not very good. It get, even though they say, that, I, I like the watch pad, um, but the, uh, in some, you need an AHI simply for research purposes. Uh, because if, if you look at our paper, I had to do it on REI, Respiratory Event Index. And the American Academy of Sleep Medicine did that on purpose so they could save relevance for the polysomnogram. They're the only ones that can give out AHI, and that's what they want all the papers written in. But I could never have gotten people to go back in. There is no way mm -hmm. I could have gotten 101 people to do this. Gotcha. You have to be in the university setting where it's absolutely free. Can you talk a little bit about that number that we see on the uh, 
the patient safety report that is indicated as an AHI, or just, just to the right of the RDI? Yeah, this, what do we see in there? Just pretend it's AHI. It's yeah. so close that it doesn't yeah. matter. Yeah. Um, what, what it does is, is you have to do RDI, respiratory disturbance index. And they just use that as a kind of a bogus number, yeah, a name. But honestly, because they set all the, they set software off of PSGs. In other words, they ran the PSG one night with the, with the pulse oximeter on the other hand, and they tweaked the algorithm till they matched the PSG is what they did. But they always over, uh, uh, they always overestimate the AHI on pulse oximeter. Gotcha. All right, one more. We'll give you a good softball here. This is from a hygienist that's looking for a dentist in the Bellevue area that makes the med supplies. How do they find somebody that makes the med supplies? I have no clue. We, we, <laughs> we make about 35 of them a month. You know, we're still researching. We can make one, but you got to call Todd and, and make an appointment to make one. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. You know, this, it might, it's going to change, but that's, we're, we're really, we're still just at the tail end of our research, really. Fantastic. Tim, how are we doing on time? Your mic's off. Tim, you're still muted, buddy. 503. There we go. Tim, you're still muted. Okay. Here we go. All righty. Thank we you. Go. I'm sorry we're out of time. <laughs> Dr. Metz, thank you very much, sir. Ms. McBride, pleasure to meet you. Uh, Dr. Ross, thank you for putting together uh, our speakers. And with that, uh, we will be uh, ending the webinar here in just a second. We're going to bring up a little PowerPoint presentation with upcoming speakers that uh, are going to be joining us. Thank you for everybody that was on the Washington Academy of General Dentistry Stay Home, Stay Healthy CE series. Our next speaker is in 20 minutes. 25 minutes, and that's Dr. Bernie Villadiego, and he'll be speaking on portrait photography. Dr. Metz, sir, thank you. Uh, appreciate it, and we look forward to seeing you out this way soon. Thank you, Timmy. I really enjoyed it. You guys, and I love the mountains. <laughs> <laughs> All righty, I'm just going to start this PowerPoint here. And Okay, so if you uh, are looking for your CE credit, your CE credit will be coming from the University of Washington School of Dentistry CE department. You can expect to see your CE credit in your inbox uh, in two to three days. Make sure you put your name on that CE and say a copy for your records. Academy of General Dentistry members, we will be submitting your CE credits directly to the Academy of General Dentistry and you can expect that CE to end up on your transcript within the next two to four weeks. You'll see some flyers going by here that have QR codes. Uh, you can use those QR codes to register for upcoming webinars or go to WashingtonAGD.org, look for the Stay Home, Stay Healthy CE logo, and then just scroll down and you can see upcoming uh, presentations. Uh, if you've missed any of our webinars, you can go to YouTube to Washington Academy of General Dentistry, or you can navigate to our webpage again, WashingtonAGD.org, click on YouTube, and that will take you to our YouTube channel. Remember to like subscribe and click the bell so you're notified every time a new uh, webinar uh, becomes available. These webinars will be available for the next couple of weeks. Uh, so feel free to share those with your colleagues, your staff members. Uh, unfortunately, if you watch uh, one of the videos on YouTube, we cannot issue you CE. Wanna thank the Canadian Academy of Restorative Dentistry and Prosthodontics. I want to thank the Academy uh, or the Arkansas Academy of General Dentistry for putting today's speakers together. Thank you again for the International Academy of Nathology for their speakers yesterday. I want to thank our sponsors, Comet USA, Patterson Dental, Seattle King County Dental Society, Snohomish County Dental Society, and Pierce County Dental Society. With that, we're going to end this webinar. Thank you very much, and thank you to all our panelists and the WAGD. Remind you, stay home, stay healthy, and we look forward to seeing you later.
Thanks, guys. Appreciate Fantastic. it. Yep. We're going to end this one and get on the next. All right. Sounds good.